All right, class, uh, we are on 3.8. This is going to be an extra video just because uh, really so we can be on time with uh, the finals and everything else that needs to happen. So extra class, here we go, 3.8, something called Im implicit differentiation. Let's go through it. Uh, let me intro, let me do intro to it first and then we'll go from there. So, so far in the class, we have taken derivatives of something maybe like this. Y is equal to X squared plus one. <clears throat> All right, if we did that, we took the derivative of y with respect to x. Let me, let me be a little bit more clear on our um, on our derivatives, okay? So here it is. If we're going to do this, just because the notation kind of makes it a little more clear here. What we've done so far is doing like this. Sometimes I, I have used this notation in class here. So d over dx, so the derivative with respect to x. So, but notice you have a y in there, right? So you say, okay, well, I'm going to take the derivative of y and the derivative of y would be one, right? It's going to be by itself. So then what we have is we have dy dx. So up until now, what we've kind of done, as I just said, hey, that's a y, just make it dy dx. But really what you're doing is you're taking a derivative of y and that's not the variable you're taking, you're trying to take the derivative of. So then you still take the derivative of the extra variable and then you just declare, I've just taken the derivative of y with respect to the x. Okay, that's just to keep in mind there. Then we take the derivative of this guy. So now notice we are taking the derivative of x. So we say to ourselves, hold, hold on, the derivative of, I don't want you to get lost in the notation just real quickly here, but I wanna show it to you here. So that's what we're doing right here. We're taking the derivative of these pieces here. So dy dx, the derivative of x squared would be 2x. And notice what we've done. We've taken the derivative of x with respect to x. That's kind of what we did. Well, that's exactly what we did here. Then here, what we do is we take the derivative of 1, which technically would just be 0, and we still put a dx dx. So the dx dx's go away because they cancel each other out. So what we have we've always done this is dy dx is equal to just to 2x. So that's easy. Say Mr. Ng of y, are you doing this? Why are you making us do such a long road, long process to get to our answer? And the reason for it is because this little piece right here, as we've thought about it, thought about it, said, you know what? I think I can use that as a, almost like a variable, its own little piece in an equation. So, instead of just a formality of notation, we think like, hold on, actually, that, that actually could be like a real substance inside an equation. So let's do this here. I'm going to change up this equation just a little bit here. I am going to subtract x squared from both sides. I'm going to get y minus x squared is equal to one. Tell me if you guys agree. Uh, you can't tell me because you're in a video in mode here, I'm not in class. Okay, so we have this right here, y minus x squared is equal to one. That's the exact same equation, right? Or it's an equivalent equation to what we studied so far. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take the derivative of both sides again. So notice what happens here. So as I sweep across from right to left, I look at them individually here. So I'm going to take the derivative of this guy. I'm going to take the derivative of this guy. And I'm going to take the derivative of this guy. So many times in math class, um, and calculus particularly, it, after a while, after you understand it, you drop a lot of the notation. You just You just make the system work faster. I'm just showing you all the different steps here, sort of see it. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take the derivative of y, because that's the variable inside here. And we have our dy dx right here, minus. We're going to take the derivative of x, and then remember those cancel, right? We take the derivative of 1, and that cancels. So notice this right here now, the dy dx is actually a substance. It's something inside an equation. And so if I were to start moving things around, just treat it like a, almost like a variable inside an equation to solve for. Notice what I do. I get the exact same thing as I had before. And then this aha moment happens like that's so awesome. I can treat so dy dx is not just a notation 
thing that we use. It's actually a piece inside an equation. It's almost like its own little variable inside an equation. And now the question to some students is, yeah, right, but how does it help? Does it really help us? Well, of course it does. Let's go for it. So how about this? Can you take the derivative of, well, actually, no, let's see how it helps us first. This guy. Notice this guy is not solved for, it's not solved for y. In fact, you guys tell me, what is this equation of? This is an equation of a circle, a radius five. So one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. So my question is, is this a function? No, it's not a function with respect to y. We can make it if you were to break it up. You don't need to copy this part, but if you were to move the x squared, take a square root, this particular equation can go into a function notation, right? It can go into uh, plus or minus, I guess we should say that here, 25 minus x squared, right? You can, you can do that, but then it's an equation it's still in a function. That's our problem. This is much cleaner. So now the question is, can I take derivatives of that? And yes, this is why we have implicit differentiation. This allows us to take uh, derivatives of equations with y or x anywhere inside the equation. They don't have to be on one particular side. And it helps us, if you guys remember back, remember in Algebra 2, you guys had conic sections, right? Those were things we use quite often in graphing and modeling our world that can't be into equations. So we have circles, right? Uh, we have uh, parabolas are also part of it, but parabolas could be changed into a function, right? Ellipses, hyperbolas, right? Uh, and it goes down. So this, this is one of them. The circle is part of the fact that you can take a, um, a derivative with a y being anywhere inside the equation, not necessarily solved for, and it does not have to be a function anymore in order to take a derivative of it. So there's, let me put this in here. Ready, ready? <clears throat> this is so important. Does not need to be a function, like with respect to y, right? To have a derivative. Now we use functions all the time, but in this case, like this one right here, this is a circle. It's not technically a function with respect to y, but I can still take derivatives. Okay, that is it. I, hopefully that kind of brought out the whole sense of things. This is so awesome. I don't have to have things set up as y equals. I don't have to have it set up as y equals, or I don't have to have it set up as f of x. For those are the only two things I can take derivatives of. Forget it. It's I can take it anytime, anywhere. So let's go for it here. Exercise one, find dy dx. Now this one, I have to be careful on my notation now because now I need to tell you which derivative I'm solving for with respect to which, I see which derivative I'm taking it and then which variable I want to solve for. Good, so that's kind of important there. So this dy dx is now very important to to be given, given, and let's do this here. Let's do this one first. X squared plus Y squared is equal to 25. Since we did that already, we might as well take a derivative of it. All right, uh, pause the video if you like right now so you can uh, try it yourself. And uh, then when you're ready, start playing it and I'll solve it here. And let's go with it. All right. Um, let's do the short way. Let's forget about all those notations that I did of d over dx and all that stuff. Let's just take the derivatives here. So if you take derivative of x with respect to x, you're going to get two x. You take derivative of y. Now you're going to get a dy, but then you've taken derivative of a variable called y. So it's going to be dy dx. You need to put that notation each time you take a derivative of a variable that is not the variable uh, that is on the bottom with that dx. Okay, and the derivative of 25, zero, are we good? 
Okay, let's solve for dy dx because that's exactly what the title says. It says find dy dx, set it equal to. So, okay, let's subtract 2x from both sides. I got 2y dy dx, negative 2x, divide through. So notice I'm treating this as a, as a variable inside an equation now. This is cool. And the twos go away, boom, boom, all gone. And I'm left with this right here. So dy dx is equal to negative x over y. That's what I have. Okay, let's go on a little bit. I, you guys can do this here. Let's go on a little bit more uh, deep into this here. So first things first, what in the world is this saying? What is dy dx and why do I have a negative x over y? What does that even mean? So let's go. If I have this circle, which is one, two, three, four, five, radius five, what we've just figured out, and pretend that's a good circle, what we've just figured out is if I find a point here along the circle, the slope will always be that slope, that m value will always be negative x divided by the y value. And that's such a cool thing. It, it seems so simple, right, when you see it here. So when you move on to this side, notice we're going to have negative x's now, right? So then with a negative x, notice you have a positive slope this time. And so we just figured out there. So for circle radius 5, the slope at any one point is just going to be the negative of the x coordinate divided by y. Okay, then the other question is this. Let's go a little bit more deep or in depth into this here. So does it really matter of the size of the circle? Notice if you have x squared plus y squared, let's go, um, let's go 9. So radius 3. When you take a derivative of 9, it's always going to be 0, right? So all these derivatives, these guys are always going to be so see if that kind of just kind of is interesting. I think it's interesting. So any size circle, if you're on the circle itself, the slope is just going to be the ratio of the coordinates times negative 1 or the negative x over y coordinate. I thought that was kind of cool. OK, so now um, let's see. Maybe we should do one more. Or we can probably we can probably do a tough one here. Let's see. Mm. Let's do one. Let's do one. Let's do B. B. Here it is. Answer. Take the derivative of. Oh, this is fun. Five y squared plus sine y is equal to x squared. That would be fun. Okay, if you're comfortable enough and you say, you know what, I'm going to take the derivative of this guy, go for it, pause the video, go for it. If you're not quite sure yet, then, um, then let's do it together. <clears throat> so let's go for it. Notice, yeah, you should notice right away, like, whoa, Mr. NG, if I have two y variables, that's interesting. And there are different locations on my equation. That's fine. Let's go for it here. So let's take the derivative of 5y squared. So that's a power rule. So 2 times 5 is 10. And we're going to subtract 1 from the exponent. And again, we've taken the derivative of y with respect to x. We do need to clue that in. Derivative of sine of y. So derivative of sine is cosine. Cosine of y dy dx. Now this one here, we're going to take the derivative of x with respect to x. So those are going to fall out. But what we have here really is just a 2x and done. Okay, question is, can you solve for dy dx? Well, there's two of them. They're both on the same side. And I think it's called uh, factoring. We're going to factor out a dy dx out of this whole thing. So we have a 10y plus cosine y is equal to 2x perfecto and let's divide let's divide by whatever we're multiplying our doi dx by and done there it is we have solved solved our equation here
Okay, so that's hopefully that's comfortable to do there. All right, let's try another one. A little, little bit more complicated here. C, just a bit more complicated. see that there's a product rule here. So again, if you're comfortable enough, let's try it yourself. Go for it. I'll pause the video. And if not, let's do this together. All right, I'm going to try this here. So notice, yep, there's a product rule right there. I'm going to take the derivative of the first times the second plus derivative of the second times the first. Let's do that. So the derivative of the first would be 3x squared. The second function is going to remain exactly the same. No changes there. Plus, now we take the derivative of sine of y, which would be cosine of y, multiplied by, I would pull a dot for multiply. Oh, that's right. We're forgetting something. We were forgetting. We're forgetting the fact that we just took the derivative of of y, so here it is, dy dx multiplied by, you can put a little dot, you can put parentheses if you like. There's my x cubed, right? So product rule says derivative first. Oh, you know what? Let me try this little thing right here. There it is. Derivative first times the second plus derivative the second and then we have to put dy dx times the first. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, there it is. I think that's the way we wrote it last time here, right? Derivative the first times the second plus derivative second times the first. Here's your product rule. Okay, let's move on. Now we move on to the little plus one right here, the dy. And we're going to take the derivative of y. In this case, it's just going to be a 1. We don't even need to write it down. We're just going to put dy dx plus. And now on the other side, actually, those don't have any y values at all. So those are all going to be, let's see, uh, derivative 4x plus 3, just be 4. That's it. OK, let's move everything that does not have a dy dx over to the right-hand side. And we'll keep everything that does. So I think I'm going to move this guy. Let's move this guy over. Right there. So let's see. And some students, what they start doing is they start doing this. Um, they start skipping a lot of steps. So in calculus, it's easy. Like, oh, I could just do this, this, this. Uh, if you want to do that, that's perfect. But the only thing is you got to just make sure you're right because the problem with calculus students is that your algebra skills may not be all that awesome, awesome. And you just might skip a little piece right there. So if you're when in doubt, just a little bit, just slow down on the steps. That's it. Don't skip too much. Just kind of bring it down and then go from there. So left side, I have only terms that have dy dx in them. I'm going to factor those out. And I'm left with x cubed cosine y plus, ooh, that one's going to be a comma 1, right? Because if you factor out the whole entire term, you're only left with that. And that's it. So we're going to divide by whatever is multiplying dy dx. I'm not even going to show the division because I'm running out of room. So I might as well just give you the final answer. Here it is, 4 minus 3x squared sine y over x cubed cosine y plus one. There it is. Oh, sorry. There it is, OK. All right, let's go on. That was example or exercise one. Let's go a little further. Exercise two. How about this? Find for me 
d2y dx squared. And then we'll just do a quick one here. Let's do a quick one right here. Because I'm sure you guys can take the second derivative of things here. So find the second derivative of this. Um, uh, let me do one example here of this guy. We've done it before already. Let you go for it. Get the first derivative, second derivative. And then we go for it here. So again, if you're comfortable, try it yourself, or at least if you want to just try it to see if you got it right, that's cool. If you want to work with me, let's go for it. This one's a, a kind of a little tiny bit tricky. So let's see where the trickiness comes from. All right. Let's jam. So I'm going to put this onto the side here. X squared plus Y squared is equal to 25. Just quickly do the derivative. This is 2X plus 2Y with a dy dx next to it is equal to zero. Move the 2x over, x and negative 2x, divide through. by the 2y, and you got yourself a negative x over y. OK, perfect. Again, slow me down the video if you need to here. That was our first derivative. OK, now we move on to the second derivative. And yes, you do want to do it in two stages. You want to keep them separate, because you'll see in just a bit here. OK, so now let's move on to doing the second derivative. OK, so first things first, I notice that this is a quotient. So I think back to my quotient rules first. Function divided by second function is going to be the derivative of the first times the second minus sign. The derivative of the first, derivative of the second times the first divided by the bottom square. There's my quotient rule. So let's go for it. So the derivative of the top function, which is top function is negative x, the bottom function is just a y. So the derivative of the top function, it'll just become a negative one multiplying y. And if you want to put parentheses just to separate your terms, that that's a good idea as well. It's a good idea. All right, minus sign. And then we're going to take the derivative of the second function of, of y. Well, if you take the derivative of y, it's going to become a 1, but then you still have your dy dx times negative x. And if you want to put a little 1 in here, just so you know what you did, that's fine. The derivative of y is 1 with a dy dx afterwards. That's perfect, just so you have it there. OK, and then I got myself uh, y squared on the bottom. All right, let's clean this up together here. I got a negative y. Uh, that becomes a plus this time, plus x dy dx over y squared. Now we have this dy dx over here that's sort of sitting in our equation. And so we go back to say, you know, hold on. We actually do know what dy dx is. It's this right here. dy dx is negative x over y. So we are going to substitute it back in. So you get this little substitutionary step if you have y values left over in your first derivative. So let's plug it in and substitute. So that dy dx now becomes negative x over y, y squared. OK, I think we're almost done, maybe. No, we got some simplifying to do. So now we have negative y, let's see, minus sign. I have x squared over y, and I have myself a complex fraction out of my hands. Oh boy, here we go. So for the top numerator, I need common denominators now. So I'm running out of space as well. So in this case, uh, we have to multiply this guy by a y over y, and I'm going to do that on the next slide. So 
negative y is multiplied by y over y to get common denominators. And I'm going to have to switch between the two slides just for a second here. Minus sign, yes, it's x squared over y and that over y squared. OK, let's keep on going. So negative y squared over y, x squared over y, y squared. Okay, got that. Simplified complex fraction. We're going to make both into fractions so we can change it to multiplication. So how about um, negative y squared minus y squared over y multiplied by the reciprocal here. And I got myself a negative y squared minus x squared over y to the third. There it is. <clears throat> and as far as answers are concerned, that's perfectly fine right there. I know some students would say, let's take out a negative. So this is a correct answer. No reason to simplify it anymore. Um, some students, whenever they see a negative x squared and a negative y squared, automatically in their mind, they want to do this. And that's OK, too take out the negative out of all this, put the x first, and that just kind of looks looks nicer. That's it, but not necessarily more correct at all. So there it is. There is my second derivative. And then the question is, hold on, isn't x squared plus y squared, isn't equal to something? Yes, so we go back to the original one right here. There it is. So if you do see the original equation, we can substitute that still further in. So let's do this here. So then we got ourselves a negative on the outside, 25 on top, y cubed on the bottom. So automatically, the question is, Mr. Hanjiev, is that one the more simplified answer? Technically, in textbooks, in most textbooks, they they will say this is the proper answer because it is the most simplest answer. You've incorporated as much as you can, and if you substitute it as much as you can, um, some algebra textbooks or some calculus textbook would say, you know, that's fine as well because it's not so much as you're just trying to find the answer. You're going to use it somewhere. You're going to use it to find something. So if you're looking at uh, how large a I don't know, an engine has to be in order to maximize or how much a pipe has to be in, or in order to maximize irrigation in the fields, you know, eventually you're going to start plugging stuff in. So that's why. So any one of those correct? Okay, my preference. My preference is this one right here. My preference is that you get to the very, very simplified answer. You, you used up the derivative, the first derivative, and you used up the original equation. You've connected those pieces together. I like the last one but I'll accept all three as, as um, real answers. <clears throat> all right, let's go with it here. That was the second derivative. Now let's, let's start using the stuff. So example three, so find the equation. Of course, we're gonna use this here. Find the equation of the, and you guys should automatically already be able to plug all this in, tangent line to the curve. <clears throat> all right. And you know what? Uh, we can actually get rid of the twos as well. So we'll cut that piece in half. 
difference is my soul. And there are many things in my mind, my mind, that is able to keep all these things afloat at times. And there, I am not the end of it. Your thoughts. So I'm trying to pull up the other side and say, hey, I need to be clear. These actually came up with Vex on Grid. Um, we call Vex on Grid. Originally, it was called the Cartesian coordinate plane. Then the Cartesian came from his name for it. And that was his coordinate plane. And uh, we kept that in the analysis called the XY grid. It's called uh, X line coordinates. And the significant historical names for these plane that's on the grid. Okay, so what he did is. Um, one of the graphs that he graphed early on was this right here. It's called the polynomial of Descartes and the loop of Descartes. And it's a line that goes like this. And it curves right when you get to the origin, comes up, and then it kind of continues. And uh, eventually, I'm not sure if he named it as that, uh, but the Latin name is polynomial, which really just means loop. So the leap of Descartes or the polynomial of Descartes, I think, pretty much for the most part, we've kept that name. But it's, it's almost like a straight line, and all of a sudden, right at the end, it just kind of has this little leap shape right there. And so we want to figure out to be the tangent line of the high point right over here. That's where we want to go. That's, that high point is going to be 3 halves, 3 halves right there. And so give me the equation line right there. All right, all yours. If you're ready to tackle it yourself, go for it. I'm gonna pause the taping or pause the video. All right, I'm back. And so let's go for it. Let's also try it together here. So uh, the derivative of y to the third, three y squared. Oh, that's right. Thing the students always ask is where does the three go? How does the three fit? Where does it go? The easiest way to answer it is first of all, you have this little minus sign. So kind of careful. You see the minus sign? So you have so you're gonna take this as a derivative. Now the single first thing is first is it's just one single term right now. It's gonna become two terms later on because of product rule. So we're gonna have to put brackets in there. And normally what we do in mathematics is we instead of getting one more parenthesis, we just take this coefficient of 3 and we tie it to a variable. So we're going to think about this as 3x and then a y. So we've got the minus sign in front, and that's going to change it to two different terms instead of one, so we need a parenthesis. So now we have the derivative of 3x, which is 3 times y plus the derivative of y, which is 1 dy dx times 3x. So we're going to pretty long this to the x, it makes it a lot easier. And now try to multiply that. The other way to do it is you can stick the whole negative 3 outside. And you 
take derivatives of u of dx. That's another way to do it. Let, let me show you that actual thing here. There's often cited. So you can think about it as negative 3 on the outside. You just push that down on the outside. And now you're going to take the derivatives of x times y. And so the derivative of x is 1 times y plus the derivative of y, which is u of dx, times x. And that's another way to do it. You would have that. All right. Let me erase this. Something. Another half of something, which is 
so there it is. One last one. 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 This is along this tangent, which is half of the tangent of the rock line. And then this is the rock is the minor, wherever it's at. It's here, it's the minor this way. It's here, it's the minor that way. So because it's really being positive, it becomes a five degree minor trajectory and it's going back to the left. So the object of the game is to restore the point of the traveling on the path of X. Axis towards zero zero. The object fires a missile and is located at three points on the spike. This means that the cluster is going to stop the fire because it's going to be the point. It's going back to the left. And it's not really saying it's going to be the point of the spike, it's saying where the So we want to figure out what is that location that we're going to go to ask them about. Okay. The next part of the question, which should be the third game, the developer will be the best to come back there. So the only next location on the left is something that's not in the game. We not have it, right? But it has to reach the X axis at the same time it has to reach the X axis. So we're going to all the Sequential equations and sequential equations. And it's going to have that in the Where do you figure out where is it going to get? What's the trajectory? Where do I get the x axis? So let's go over here. So take the mirror. Where would that one be? The x. So it would be the 3 pi 3 pi x.
So when you walk through this one this way, it's shot. Shot a missile. This left the travel This to travel right into the shot. And the left is on the door and the x-axis at Drawing out each individual piece, and then we go to the next slide and we kind of just do the, the hair on the uh, animation hair. So we just move it just a little bit to get the next piece. That was the first move, we were able to get an equation. So we can use only 20 here. And we say, this hair, we try to go in, it's going to be this direction. And so what happens is the next hair will be kind of a third thing. So then we can give you a realistic feel of wind passing through. Creature and it's all because of this one here. It's pretty much the equation that we have in order to produce a visual effect of that. And our equation is a visual effect of a missile that passed through. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed the video and I hope you learned something. And see you next week.